And now you have government <coughs> blaming it on their wives. She wants to feed everybody. That's going to break us. She wants to take care of every poor person in the neighborhood. That's going to break us. Now, I'm not saying that you, can't, you have to do that and just throw money at it. But what I'm saying is, it's a damn lie why it's happened. It's a damn lie. Every problem in the monetary system until this one was caused by war. We went off the gold standard. Everybody went off it prior to World War I. Because they, you could fight more guns. It started with war. It's ending with war. And we are now right here. I think a lot of people now know the name of John Exter. Okay? And when I began thinking about money, I ran across the name of a man. Somebody said, I heard this man speak in Southern California. He has never written a book. And he said something, blah, blah, blah. And I go, wow, who is this guy? So I went digging around. John Exter's inverse, inverse pyramid was not on the web. No one really knew about John Exter, except I found out the professor did later. All right? I found that Franklin Saunders knew John Exter. All right? Franklin Saunders, along with Professor Fekete and other serious people about money, had all met at the CMRE in New York, the Com Com Committee for Monetary Reform and Education. This is where people who thought about money in the United States went. This is where the professor was. All right? John Exeter was a banker, central banker. All right? And I had no idea that professor knew him. My friend, our friend Marshall, had flown the professor and his wife in from Hungary to give a keynote speech at an event for Buck, about Bucky Fuller's thoughts and his vision. An incredible vision. All right? So Marshall flew the professor in. Professor gave this incredible speech, got a standing ovation. And I'm giving my own drivel at the end. And I'm talking about John Extra. And the professor goes, I knew John. I said, you did? He said, yes, I knew him. And he said, do you know why he became a gold bug? I said, no. He said, because when he was vice president of the New York Fed, he saw all that gold leaving in the 50s. In the 50s, in 1958, the United States lost 10% of its gold reserves. We closed the gold window in 1970. But if you figure out in one year we lost 10% in 58, how much gold does that leave us? We've never had a public audit since 1954. If your spouse won't let you look at the bank account, if your spouse won't you look at how much money you got in it, you know something's going wrong. All right? So Exeter was this extraordinary person. He grew up in the Depression, wanted to figure out what was going wrong, went to work for City, you know, City, went to the New York Fed, and he was there when they shut the gold window. And it's in uh, Ferdinand Lips's book, Gold Wars. And Exter said, and Exter was one of the guys at this time. You know, he was ex-Fed, you know, uh, in charge of gold and silver operations at the Fed in New York. And he said they were in, de debating what to do. This is before the gold window was shut in August 1971. What do we do? What do we do? Debate was going on. And he said a big black limousine pulls up. Paul Volcker gets out and they walk in. All right? Paul Volcker comes out. And Focus says, what do you think I ought to do? What do we do here? And the extra goes, raise the price of gold. Got to raise the price of gold. Volker goes, I can't get away with it. Politically, I can't get away with it. What else do we do? And Volker and extra goes, if you're not going to raise the price of gold, you're going to have to shut that gold window, which is very draconian. And I don't know if he thought Volker would do it. But Volker did. Volker shut, went to Nixon. Shut the gold window. And you know who else wanted that gold window shut? Milton Friedman, the poster boy of the right. All right? I know most people in this room hate John Maynard Keynes. Well, I think you ought to split it 50 50. <laughs> you know? They shut the gold window, tremendous inflation happened, and for the first time in the banker system, money was fiat. Now, what have we got? We've got three pillars. The first pillar is confidence in paper money. 
The second pillar was balance between credit and debt. And the third pillar was constantly expanding economic base. All right? What happened is when they shut the gold window, they started the degradation of paper money. They pulled out the only thing that was going to give it any credence. And basically it was a con game anyway. It was a con game. They never had 100% coverage. It was a way to get more so they had more chits in play. But as long as they had enough, they could keep the con game up. They didn't have to work. But in 71, when they cut the gold window, there went leg number one. Leg number two went shortly thereafter. Why? Because gold acts as a constraint on the supply of paper money in the West. When you had to actually trade pieces of paper for gold, you weren't going to print a whole lot of paper because you were going to have to give up gold for that piece of paper. So there was a natural discipline. It's like a gun to your head. And all of a sudden, there was no more gun. Wow! Everybody started printing. And especially in the United States. Especially in the United States. <clears throat> Ronald Reagan came and he was voted in in 1980 on a balanced budget. You want to know why politicians lie? Because it works. Politicians are no different than the man who comes on home, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, with a girlfriend on the side and a couple of kids, and says, hi, dear, how are you? Because it works. He was elected on a balanced budget, a promise to balance the budget. In two terms when he left, when he started, the United States owed less than $1 trillion. After over 200 years in existence of this country, this country owed less than a trillion. When he left office in two terms, we owed almost $4 trillion. And you know what? He was the most beloved president in the history of the United States. And you wonder why politicians lie to you. Because it works. All they have to do is tell you what you want to hear. And you'll vote for it. It works on both sides of the fence. But that's why it works. So what happened is, not only did they start the degradation of monetary supply, they blew out the balance between credit and debt. The constraint on money, on paper money, gone. The belt is off. All of a sudden, you had one of those expando belts. You know, guy had walked around before looking pretty good here. He could only breathe so much. He could only eat so much. And all of a sudden, the belt's gone. He's got elastic. The guy looks like a pig in 20 years. And it happened to every country on the planet. So now, there's number two. All right? And number three, the expansion of the economic base. You know what? Globalization, I love this thing about freedom. I used to think about Hong Kong. Hong Kong's a wonderful place. Why? Because they had a free flow of currency. We all love freedom. I mean, you don't? We all love freedom. Well, what did the free flow of currencies mean? It meant that the Western banks, with their coupons, could come over and buy any damn thing you got in the ground, including oil or manufactured goods, gives you these pieces of paper for it, and you couldn't stop them. No controls. No currency controls. Free flow. Who did it benefit? It benefited the boys who printed the paper. All right? So now you had, all of a sudden, Asia into the game. Chinese. These people who had made a promise, we're not going to have this paper money again, and all of a sudden the West comes over with more paper money and it saves the Chinese. You know, these guys were such nuts. They were, Mao Zedong had them making steel in the backyard. You know, we're going to have a you know, great leap forward, all this kind of crap. Didn't work. But I tell you, in the Chinese hierarchy of consciousness or of society, merchants were really at the bottom. It really worked. They didn't have much in, China, in the Confucian system. Merchants weren't way up there. But it's sort of a canard because the Chinese at heart are shopkeepers. These people love business. They love buying and selling. And they hate spending. <laughs> they thought China was going to save us. I looked at Martha I said, these people don't understand what they're dealing with. These people are going to end up with a lot of paper and not buy anything. And when they do buy it, they want to make sure you're on, at a loss. I had a company in 1981. I had a $400,000 line of credit. Volcker raised the interest rates to 21.5%. I went to 24%. My $400,000 line of credit with luxury carpets, hand-knotted carpets, all of a sudden linoleum was good enough. 
I couldn't sell a thing. And some Chinese ladies come around, and you know what she wanted to know? It's like a hunter shooting something, and he wants to watch it bleed to death. She wanted to know how much I paid for it before she bought it. She wanted to know how much I was losing before she bought the thing. And I never sold her the rug. I wasn't going to give her that satisfaction. But what happened is, when, when the economy, when capitalism moved to the East, it moved into, there's a great difference between the East and the West. Just like there's a great difference between the male and female consciousness. There's a great difference between the yin and the yang. And these polarities have been at war with each other since the beginning. My belief is the war is ending, but it's going to end in a, we're not there yet, but it is going to end. And these polarities are going to balance out themselves. It's not going to be one over the other. It's not going to be the domination of one polarity by the other. There's going to be a coming together. All right? The domestic dispute's going to be over. But we're not there yet. Now, China and the East, Japan, India, they are very different than the West in one critical way. They had a very high savings rate. These people were frugal. These people were frugal. Just like our parents were frugal three generations ago. I can tell you, my parents were a lot more frugal than I was. All right? The, Ch the Orient still was frugal. So when the West rushed into the East, they needed to keep that thing going, that thing going, that thing going. They needed to keep that credit moving in the system. They needed to keep debts being repaid. They needed to keep it moving from the arm over the leg, the head over to the foot. They needed to keep it in circulation. And all of a sudden, much of their chagrin and surprise, that money went to the East and wasn't coming back. Now, to the Asians, what the hell? We bought your crap. We got the money. What's wrong with it? Now, Taiwan was the first person. Taiwan was the first country in Asia that had a really big problem down compared to its citizens. Japan was next. Blah, 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 blah. Taiwan. Let me tell you what happened with Taiwan. This is the 1970s. Japan got that big trade imbalance in the 80s. Taiwan is making radios and electronic goods, okay? Selling all this stuff in the United States. And all of a sudden, we got an imbalance of trade. Taiwan ended up with all these excess, excess dollars. I mean, what the hell? It's like somebody calling the profit they made on the house that they bought from you excess. All right? But what the United States is, they went over there and said, you got to do something about this money that you got. you got to buy something from us. Well, how many Taiwanese are there? You know, they could each buy three cars and it wouldn't make a dent. All right? And they weren't about to. But we came over and they said, you got to do something. Well, let me tell you how the East thinks. Chinese sat around and thought about it. We've got to do something. These guys are getting uptight, a little stash of money. So they said, OK, we, we've got a plan. Americans go, oh, good. What are you going to do with all that money? And Taiwanese said, we're going to buy gold bullion. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That isn't the way the game works. Taiwan goes, well, what? We got all this money. It's our money. You want us to buy stuff from the United States? The balance of trade? We don't need much. We want to buy bullion. That's not how the game works. That's not how the game works. All right? And it doesn't work that way. It works the way the bankers want it to work. The bankers designed it to work a certain way. But where we are now is right here. That whole era is over. John Extra was an amazing man. He died in 2006. I found that piece of, I found that little old inverse pyramid, put it on the web, now everybody knows it. All right? And I had a conversation with Extra's daughter. And uh, she said, you know, I really wish my dad lived to see what was happening. And I said, I don't think your dad needed to see what was happening. He already knew he was right. Exter saw what was happening in the 60s, went out, bought gold, and quit his job. He quit his job in the early 70s. He had so much gold at $35 an ounce, he didn't have to do anything as soon as it was legalized. I mean, he probably paid, what, 42 at the time he actually got in the market? And he sat back and he watched it. Now, very interesting about Exter. Exter was a real smart man. He was convinced we were headed towards the deflationary collapse, just like it had in the Depression. Convinced of it. It was going to happen. 
It was going to happen. And his son-in-law, there's an interview with him up in the web. And the son-in-law also had a job in finance and used to go to work with his father-in-law. I mean, I, I know those guys in here know what it's like to have a father-in-law, especially someone like John Extra. <clears throat> Older, really smart, you know, kind man. <clears throat> but far above him in terms of his vision. And his son-in-law said, Sean, you're telling He was saying, listen, you've got to watch for something. This will be a clue when this thing is going to collapse. When the amount of aggregate debt stops growing. Remember the third thing? That the expansion of the economic base has to keep growing? For whatever reason. Exter knew it too. So he told his son, his son-in-law, keep your eye on aggregate debt. Private debt. When it stops growing, that's when it's going to, you're in trouble. This is a graph, okay? And you can see here that they go up like this, go up like this. One is blue, this one's yellow. And this is 1940. This is the end of World War II, all right? This is private debt to GDP. The line at the bottom that, that what is it? It goes from, um, I would say, 25 up to 150. So we have a, a change of um, 25, four times, uh, to 100, six times, you know, six tuples. That was the growth of Australia's debt from 1940 to 2010. All right? Then we have this middle line, all right? And this is the US. It went from a baseline of 50 up to 300. Also a sex tuple. Okay? And then you have the UK, which also started out here basically at a baseline of 50 and ended up at 500. 10 times the amount of debt. What each one of these have in common, in 210, they began falling. Each one. That's where we are now. The danger signal, the Armageddon signal, has been triggered. That extra pointed out. It's already been triggered. We're not waiting for it. It's already happened. I don't think Exter had to live to see it. He knew it was coming. He knew it was coming. He didn't need to see it. Now, let's go back to here. Let's go back to his way. Professor David Hackett Fisher talked about these waves of rising prices. I want to tell you what he said. During each great wave, that meant the wave between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the wave between the Renaissance and the Age of Enlightenment, the wave between the Age of Enlightenment and Victorian stability, and this current wave, great wave, which is higher in amplitude than any previous wave. This is what they have in common, according to Professor Fisher. During each great wave, food and fuel led the upward movement. Manufactured goods and services lagged behind. These patterns indicated that the prime mover was excess aggregate demand generated by an acceleration of population growth or by living st rising lender standards or both. Just who came into the game in the last 20 years? The most, one of the most populous nations on the face of the earth. They're all driving cars and they're using the same damn gas that we use. And they have more money than we do. At this moment, there are more people in Asia who have wealth, disposable wealth, in excess of $100 million than in the rest of the world. In Asia, it used to be the United States. Here it was third. Now it's Asia. Then the United States. Then Europe. Ten years ago, this wasn't true. Five years ago, it wasn't true. It's true now. In each great wave, Fisher goes, prices went higher and became increasingly unstable. They began to surge and decline in movements of increasing volatility. Severe price shocks were felt in commodity movements. The money supply was alternately expanded and contracted. Each one of these 
The money supply ultimately expanded and contracted as economies fought for stability in an increasingly unstable environment. Financial markets became unstable. Government spending grew faster than revenue and public debt increased at a rapid rate. What? Wages, which had first kept up with prices, now lagged behind. Returns to labor declined while returns to land and capital increased. The rich grew richer. Inequalities of wealth and income increased. So did hunger, homelessness, crime, violence, drink, drugs, and family disruption. And finally, the great wave crested and broke with shattering force in a cultural crisis that included demographic contraction, economic collapse, political revolution, international war, and social violence. That happened in every one of these. We are here right now. We are here right now. Professor Antal Fekete is not different than those scholars during those Chinese dynasties who looked at China's money and called it empty money, or they called it orphan money, with no real father or mother. They knew that there was trouble. The Austrian school was the only real understanding of what, quote, capital markets were really all about and debt-based money and paper money. And let me tell you, the boys in New York knew it. Ludwig von Mises, one of the greatest economic thinkers of our times, came to the United States, fled Germany, and after the war he got a job teaching economics at NYU. And I think it's because of your friend, Professor, the, 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 you quote him at NYU, I forget his name, you, it was stunning, you know, what he said about money and stuff like that. He was at NYU, and he brought von Mises to NYU. But let me tell you something about him. He never had a salary from the university. He had to be supported by private donations. The boys knew he was a threat to their system. When the professor met Paul Volcker at Princeton, one summer, before Volcker became chairman of the Fed, Volcker, he had a talk with the professor. And he let him have the floor at his seminar in Princeton. And he talked about gold. This is back in the 70s. And Professor Fekete said, they talked later, and Volcker told him, oh, you know, we could do all these things, you can get these grants and stuff like that. And Professor Fekete said he knew it was a bribe. He knew there were strings attached. That once you were co-opted, you had to toe the line. This has come at a cost to Professor Antal Fekete. This man has stood up against power. And we're not talking a little amount of power. We're talking about the heart of power for the last 300 years. Trillions of dollars dancing on computer screens all across the world. And the Austrian school knew that it didn't matter how many screens you had. It didn't matter how many coupons you had in play. It was going to end badly. And confidence is always a critical element in any confidence game. And they don't want anybody to know that there is really no foundation on which we are all walking. Because if everybody heads for the exit at once, you might as well not even leave your seat. My respect for Professor Fekete is, came when after I understood who this man was. I mean, I'm a gold guy. I always have been. Gold's going to go up and up and up. And then one day, we were in Dallas. And Professor Fekete looked over and he said, you know, when gold does what everybody wants it to do, Take that last leap up. It's going to be the saddest day on earth. There's going to be so much suffering. There's going to be so much pain because it's a cotter pin of modern civilization. You don't hear other people talking like that. Now, what's going to happen is this is going to come down. 
as it always has, as it always will. But what David Hackett Fisher said, after every come down, after every collapse, a new society came together, became more stable, and was far better than the society that it replaced. The Renaissance was a much better time than the Middle Ages. The Age of Enlightenment, you didn't have to be Catholic, all right? And then the Victorian stability brought the East and West together. It brought absolute advancements in technology that we couldn't even believe in. I mean, those damn cell phones, it's like having a tele telephone booth in your pocket. It's amazing, all right? It has catapulted us into the material heavens. And we've gone a long way from our roots. We have forgotten who we are. And I think, when we're down here, we're going to remember. Thanks very much, Daryl, for such an entertaining speech. That was that was great. Thank you. Um, I think we'll uh, we'll we'll have a break for 15 minutes, and I'm sure that there are many questions um, on the back of that. Um, so, see you in 15 minutes.